Hello, good day, and welcome to my third part in the six part series on sustainable agriculture. In this part today, I'm going to be talking about climate and sustainable agriculture, particularly food security. So climate change is really expected to have a major impact on the agricultural sector. And this is, will be through variability with regard to temperature, frequent, also frequency and intensity of weather, weather events, changes in rain patterns, and in also in water availability through changes in ecosystems. So when we talk about climate change, we are talking about um, long-term changes in weather. And this is often a misconception that people have, because when we talk about climate change, we're talking about changes in the long-term averages of weather. So essentially climate and weather is really just a measure, uh, is a measure of time, if the difference is a measure of time. So weather, it's, weather is what conditions and, of the atmosphere over a very short period of time, and climate is how the atmosphere behaves over a longer period of time. And scientists generally look at patterns over 30 years. Um, most people and, and people who deny climate change will often say things like, you know, pointing to a very cold winter, but they don't really understand that climate change is identified through this analysis of average temperatures over a long period of time. So what are the major effects of climate change on agriculture? Or what do we expect that these will be? Well, we will likely see an increased variability of production, a, a decrease of production in certain areas, and so a change in the geography of production. We can likely see it changes in the production patterns due to higher temperatures, a boost in agricultural productivity, uh, due to increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And of course, changing precipitation patterns, which of course increases the vulnerability of landless people and the poor in particular. So in order for agriculture to adapt to these changes, government will need to develop new varieties of crops, of course, but they'll also need to support more infrastructure projects and help advances in management practices and policies that support international cooperation efforts to, 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 to address all of these monumental changes. Now, governments can also support mitigation strategies in agriculture by basically supporting projects that reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. Now, climate change mitigation is what we've referred to, to re when we're talking about reducing or preventing emissions of greenhouse gases. And mitigation can mean, of course, using new technologies or renewable energies, making older equipment more energy efficient, or by changing the management practices or consumer behaviors. So efforts are underway then around the world to protect natural carbon sinks like forests and oceans, and to create new sinks through green agriculture, which I will be discussing more. And since the industrial revolution, of course, humans have been changing the global climate by emitting high levels of greenhouse gases right from the 1600s. But this, this has resulted in higher temperatures for a long period of time. But of course, now we see a much drastic increase. Solar radiation, temperature and precipitation are the main drivers of crop growth. And agriculture has always been highly dependent on these climate patterns and variations. But it was really not until the 1990s that we started to see climate change as the significant problem that we see it is today. We believed then that agriculture or the effects of climate change on agriculture would essentially be manageable and that the effects of climate change um, yeah, essentially that we would be able to manage them. We believe that trade would buffer any of the negative yields in certain areas. It, would all, it was also argued in some cases that increased trade was needed through further trade liberalization. 
in the 2000s, the potential problems though became more recognizable because of the incidence of drought and hunger was on the rise, right? Um, particularly in poorer countries. And this is where adaptation, and this is differentiated from mitigation, and this is where adaptation comes into play and it is very important. So adaptation essentially means anticipating the adverse effects of climate change and taking appropriate action to prevent or to minimize the damage that can, that can be caused. And also to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. It, it has been shown that if there are well-planned and early adaptation actions, then we can save a lot of money and lives later on. So examples of adaptation are things like using water, using scarce water resources more efficiently, uh, building flood defenses and raising the levels of dikes, developing drought tolerant crops, and also choosing tree species and forestry practices that are less, that mean that they will be, forests will be less vulnerable to storms and to fires. So in the last decade, the international consensus, luckily an international consensus has been reached about climate change being anthropogenic. In other words, we see that the levels of climate change that we are seeing today are man-made. This means that there is a certainty within the scientific community um, that climate change is caused by human activity, which means also that, of course, we can do something. Um, in terms of the, in, as a political scientist, we talk about climate change discourse. And while climate change it has been largely relegated to the hard scientists. Political scientists like myself are really becoming aware of the ways in which discourse has an impact on, on the way that we address climate change in scientific communities, but also in political communities. And the way that people talk about climate change has an impact on the scope of the actions that governments are willing to take as well. So political scientists like myself, we employ discourse analysis as a central theoretical approach to talking about climate change and bringing attention to the problem. Um, some like myself also talk about it in terms of the impact of ag on agriculture. And some of the kinds of questions that I look at are what are the narratives that are being used by different actors in relation to climate change? And how do national level narratives, how do these differ from global discourses? And which claims are, have more epistemic weight, which more are considered more important? We also look at what voices are privileged. In the case of agriculture, is it the farmers, the scientists, the international organizations, corporations, and actually how also do activists and social rights people, how do they engage in these discussions? How do they influence the discussion around climate change in agriculture? And how do these narratives of various voices in the development debate relate to the scientific knowledge on climate change? This is also a very important question. And how is that scientific knowledge used by these actors? Also, what are sort of the political understanding standings informing the scientific discourse? So in, there are two, sorry. And we are essentially dealing with two important concerns. Um, when we talk about climate change in agriculture, there are two major issues. First, we have to look at the need to achieve food security and to feed the 1 billion people in the world who are going hungry. 
And experts, experts are estimating that food production needs to increase by as much as 60% by 2050 in order to feed the growing population of the world. So adaptation to climate change then is a critical aspect of keeping production high and also in increasing production. The second issue is the need to avoid dangerous climate change effects. So in order to keep the global average temperature from increasing, we would need to cur curtail CO2 emissions considerably. And depending on how experts calculate CO2 emissions related to agriculture, it's also estimated that these emissions could account for anywhere between 30 to 50% of the total global emissions. And this is where mitigation, of course, becomes critical. It is also generally agreed though that 25% of carbon dioxide emissions are produced by agricultural sources. And this through deforestation, the use of fossil based fertilizers, and of course, burning of biomass is also critical, is also an important contributor. Most of the methane in the atmosphere comes from domestic ruminants, forest fires, wetland, rice cultivation, and also waste products. And conventional tillage and fertilizer use accounts for 70% of nitrous oxides. So in, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, three causes of the increase in greenhouse gases observed over the last 250 years have been from fossil fuels, well, land use and agriculture. As agriculture, it contributes to a high percentage of CO2 emissions, reducing them then must be a really significant part in order to try to tackle climate change. Now, I just wanna give you uh, an example of the case study of cassava, because this is an important um, effort. And when we recognize that climate change can have a negative impacts for agricultural production, it also has generated a desire to rebuild these systems. And one rational and cost-effective way is through crop diversification. Crop diversification essentially can improve resilience in many ways. It, it by in, engendering sort of a greater ability to suppress pest outbreaks, but also to dampen pathogen transmission. It can also uh, worsen under climate, which these things can worsen under climate change scenarios. It can also, we can also buffer, it can also, crop diversification can also buffer the effects of greater climate variability and extreme weather events. So such, benefits really point toward the obvious value of adapting crop diversification to improve resilience. Yet adaptation has been quite slow and there have been economic incentives encouraging production of a select few crops, which is really problematic. And these, this is also coupled with a push for more biotechnology strategies. And the, uh, this belief that's become so ingrained that monocultures are always more productive than diversified systems. And this has really had hindered the capacity to promote this diversification strategy. But crop diversification can be implemented in a variety of forms and at different scales. And this allows the farmers to create strategies that will work for them in their given area. So in the, the case here in Africa, the impacts of climate change have moved farmers to, to look towards diversifying what they're growing. And cassava has emerged as an egg, it's pictured here, the, the root vegetable, and it has emerged as an ideal candidate, right? Um, it is already accounts for a third of Africa's total color intake, and it is better suited than virtually any crop to withstand increases in temperatures. This includes things like maize, sorghum, banana, beans, which have all had 
been negatively impacted by climate change in some areas of Africa. Cassava also provides a source of food in periods of the year when other crops are unavailable. It's a very tough crop. And because it originated in very hot and dry conditions in Latin America, it has been able to adapt to drought and dry spells by essentially going to sleep for a time. In essence, it's essentially it's a hibernating crop. Cassava, well, it does not provide the only possible alternative future, obviously. It's been identified as one of those crops that will help Africa to adopt to, adapt to climate change. And, and of course, Latin America as well, where it originated from. And there are many possible uh, solutions, of course, to this aside from cassava in terms of mitigating the effects and adapting to the effects of climate change. And one of those, of course, one of those more broader approaches is agroecology, which I will discuss in a later lecture. But food security really depends on alternative farming methods. It also depends on protecting and enhancing the rights of farmers and protecting the rights of people to access culturally appropriate food. And this is where food sovereignty as closely related to basically sustainable agriculture generally is, becomes very important. And this is where the, the next subject of the next lecture. <laughs>